Um, right, this is Piero's uh, The Baptism of Christ. Uh, paintings are projections of pictures in the mind. They exist physically in reality, which is one reason why they last, and also one reason why they can be bought and sold. Painters can go rich while poets starve solely because painters produce unique artifacts that can become vehicles for investment. Poets create memorable talk, which is about the least saleable substance in the marketplace. Uh, paintings like poems are projections of pictures in the mind. Uh, this one by Piero della Francesca projects an image of the moment that Christ was baptized. The painting exists in reality uh, uh, as pigment uh, on a wooden panel, but its meaning is totally insubstantial. It exists only in our minds, your, my mind, your mind, and in the mind of the artist who made it. Paintings can only be seen by other human beings. There is no evidence, as far as I know, that any animal has been deceived even by a painted illusion, and certainly none that shows that any creature, apart from us, appreciates the overall impact of a painting. Uh, this was the, uh, this seizes as a whole. The ability of a painting, this was the ability of a painting that so fascinated Leonardo. As he put it, he said, I quote him, to generate a proportional harmony in the time equivalent to a single glance. This painting is a wonderful example of that sense of proportional harmony that we can appreciate in a single glance. This picture existed in the mind of a man 500 years ago, and it exists in our minds at this moment. That is an extraordinary transcendence of time, and therefore of death, but is also a transcendence of our feelings of individuality and isolation because the, this picture exists in all of our minds at the same time now. Of course, our perceptions of it will be tinted by our personal perspectives. It will look different to a Christian or a Muslim, a Buddhist or an atheist, but the essence of its meaning will remain the same. We all know we're looking at a painting, not of violence and loudness, but of stillness and silence. Paintings are projections of mind's eye pictures whose meaning exists not out there in the material world, but in the extraordinary, apparently immaterial, but vitally important sphere of our collective consciousness. There are many elements that come together to create this painting's powerful overall impact of quietude of a moment stilled in time. I could talk for a long time about it, but I only want to concentrate on one, the articulation of light. The rising pillar of the tree, the rhythmic angles of the legs and feet, the reflection of the sky and the water, the receding path and the angel's wing all help focus one's attention on the central, pale, pivotal figure of Christ. His hands raised in prayer point up to the hovering white dove, a tiny detail which you perhaps you can't really see, for, I'm afraid, in this slide, uh, uh, is that the dove's pure white triangular beak pointing down is echoed perfectly in the triangular drip of water that is about to fall on Christ's head from the upturned bowl that the Baptist holds. Piero has tried to capture the precise second when Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit and began his mission. The moment when, in Christian belief, the whole world was transformed by hope, hence the glorious light. There's another detail which you certainly won't be able to see, I know you can't, because it's almost entirely lost in the original. Rays of pure gold, little lines of pure gold, fall down from the dove and are projected out horizontally in the now almost invisible halo on Christ's head. For this is the moment that the world was filled with the spiritual light of God's truth, which descended from heaven and was distributed across the world. That world for Piero, as it was for almost everyone at that time, that world was flat and square, located under the rotating hemisphere of heaven. This eternal geometry gives this altarpiece its shape, uh, a hemisphere above a square. And it governs its internal composition and is key to the instant impression that the painting gives of centralized stillness. Leonardo's Mona Lisa was painted half a century later after the Piero, a decade of just 10 years after Columbus had sailed, when people knew the world was round. It creates a very different overall sense of stillness. 
It is almost impossible to see this painting today because it is hidden under an old discolored varnish. We know the original painting underneath is in wonderful condition. A contemporary described seeing it when it was freshly painted, and, and the, this is a quote, her eyes had that watery sheen always seen in life, her nostrils were rosy and tender and appeared to breathe. The opening of her mouth seemed not to be colored, but to be living flesh. It is still like that underneath. If we can operate on an eye, we can certainly remove an old varnish, decayed varnish, put on centuries after Leonardo, 200 years ago this one. The fact that we've been content to let the Mona Lisa be obscured by filth will be seen to be symbolic of an age that has eclipsed the role of art. Like Pierre Le Piero, this picture has an overall impact. Again, many, many factors contribute to this instant sensation, but I'd like to concentrate on just one. I'd like to concentrate on its mistiness, the sfumato effect that Leonardo was so famous for. This mistiness is so different from Piero's clarity. This isn't just the effect of the discolored varnish and this rather bad slide I see now, uh, uh, but it, there, it's there in this brilliant painting underneath. The more Leonardo looked at the world, and he studied every aspect he could see, searching for the causes of appearances, the more he looked, the more he came to the conclusion that nothing was definitely defined. Mystery receded everywhere before his gaze. This painting is darker than the Piero, not again just because of the varnish, but because it was painted on the threshold of the Enlightenment. Fundamentally, Leonardo had begun to doubt that God had created the world as we see it. The world wasn't radiated with God's light, as in the Piero painting, but eroded everywhere by darkness and doubt. The famous smile in the eyes as well as in the mouth is one that is aware of life as well as death. There is evidence that Leonardo was also on the point of discovering the immense age of the landscape and the transformations it had undergone. The two sea levels at the back of this picture perhaps suggest this. The Mona Lisa is a remarkable evocation of a world in flux, a contained vision, you might say, of transients. Uh, Velazquez Las Meninas was painted 50 years after Galileo uh, turned his telescope on the moon and discovered that it wasn't an image of a Madonna, a lumin it wa wasn't an image of the Madonna, it wasn't a luminous, watery sphere lifting souls up to heaven, but a lump of solid rock. Paintings are projections of pictures in the mind that have an overall instantaneous impact, a completeness that lifts them out of time. What is the overall impact of this picture? You can't really appreciate it here, I'm afraid, but only in the Prado, where its scale sim simply stuns you. The figures are nearly life-size. The painting is like a huge hole punched in the wall, enabling you to look through to people standing in another room. One is the artist himself. Then in that instance, you realize that though you thought at first you're looking at them, these people are actually looking at you. It's not just that Velasquez himself is looking at you, but he's painting you. You are in the picture and no longer in another room. Then another revelation immediately follows. You are standing on the spot where the king and queen are standing being painted. You can see their figures, not yours, reflected in the mirror at the back. This is an extraordinary conceit and most poignant for its time to put a commoner in the royal place. The Enlightenment saw the erosion of all the old assumed hierarchies in nature and mankind. The brightest note in the painting comes from the higher room beyond, where a man glances back at the benighted interior, as if he were leaving the self-deluded occupants of Plato's cave. This painting is one of the world's profoundest meditations on transience, yet it is contained within a single glance. From darkness to a very different sort of light, I'm leaping through the centuries, as you can see. Uh, another room, another projection of a picture in the mind. Matisse's Red Studio, painted 250 years after Velasquez Las Meninas. After scientists had finally stripped all illusions from appearances and shown that the universe is governed by forces we cannot see. It was then that something we misguidedly continue to call modern art was born, as if modern art was different in kind from the art of the past 
This is nonsensical. All art is modern when it is made, and all art is a projection of a picture in the mind. And the art which lasts is that which transcends time, which lifts it above its specific moment and enables it to express something that still matters to us. This painting is no different, in essence, from Piero's baptism. Both paintings depict images, imagined spaces full of light. And the light in both, I would suggest, is equally immaterial. The light in the Piero is clearly inspired by Christian belief. In the Matisse, the light uh, is the artist's inspiration generated when he is painting. The love he feels for living as fully as he can in the moment, uh, 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 following, he hadn't read Ray Tallis, but he did it anyway. Uh, uh, he, living in the moment, the intense red of his heightened awareness that enlivens everything, the walls, the chairs, the tables, and makes the floor liquid to walk upon. Here, everything is consumed in the flames of feeling. And floating in this world of passion are his own paintings, more luminous projections of pictures in the mind. Only one window on the left shows ordinary daylight. It is muted in comparison with the light in the mind. And in the center of the picture stands a clock, for even time, in moments of rapture, can appear to stop or at least be stilled. So the moment appears to be held forever in a brilliant work of art. It is clearly absurd to call this painting modern and the Piero not. Both are projections of pictures in the artist's mind, and both are attempts to lift experience out of time. This is what all artists have always tried to do, whatever their medium. They try to capture experience without killing it, and by doing so, they triumph over death. That's why we value their achievements so highly. We build our civilizations on the lasting arts. But the question is, what are we building today? Uh, Sir Nicholas Sorota, director of the Tate, has made very few statements explaining the philosophy that has guided his reign over the last nearly 30 years. In, in a rare instance in a lecture he gave in 1996, he argued, and I quote, that in the Red Studio, this is Nick Sroda talking, in the Red Studio by Matisse, we can trace the beginning of a change in the way in which artists regard their own work and its place in the museum. Sroda claimed that Matisse, by placing his own paintings in this picture, was creating a proto-modern museum space. He was doing nothing of the sort. He was doing what artists have always done. He was creating the wholeness that's essential to the meaning of a work of art. Matisse's Red Studio is a great work of art anywhere, in a street leaning on a railing, in a bedroom by a curtain. It doesn't need a museum to exist. I'm a museum curator and I, I know this. A museum's job is to preserve things of lasting significance from the past. What's wrong, what's gone wrong recently, is that museums have begun to create that lasting significance themselves. Sorota and a new breed of priesthood creators have, curators have elevated their galleries into sacred spaces where anything ephemeral, any ephemeral object displayed in them becomes blessed with the aura and value of art. The museum has become the transcendent space and art itself has ceased to exist. The reasons why this has happened are, are, are complex, too complex to go into here. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it later. But none of it could happen without one single theft. And I just want to talk about this briefly. Marcel Duchamp claimed in the 1960s that he sent his, this urinal into an exhibition in New York in 1917, declaring that anything could be art if an artist said it was. He wanted at the end of his life to be acclaimed as one of the founding fathers of modern art alongside Matisse and Picasso. Uh, but he had nothing truly original to show from that time. And his plans succeeded. I was just interviewed a couple of days ago by a Korean uh, a reporter who was taught to spend a whole semester in Korea uh, uh, talking about the significance of this piece. But uh, since he had nothing at that time, of the same time that M Matisse and Picasso was doing all their revolutionary work, he had to, he had to uh, uh, steal something. And he stole this work from the long forgotten great German poet and performance artist, Baroness Elsa von Freytag Loringhoven, long after she died in 1927. Even though she was celebrated during her life and was the star of the Little Review, the famous New York Radical Museum ma magazine, uh, alongside James Joyce when they were printing Ulysses, they were publishing Elsa, uh, she being a poet, of course, died in abject poverty, in and out of prison for shoplifting, making, as she said, friends of rats. 
Elsa only became a baroness on her third marriage. She was born plain Elsa Plotz in Schweinmunder in Germany in 1874. Her father was a builder, councillor and philanderer who inflicted her mother with syphilis. She died in a mental institution, leaving Elsa with her inheritance, which she said was tough fight. Elsa sent this urinal in to an exhibition in New York as a blistering attack on America when it declared war on her beloved Germany in 1917. To her, the urinal laid on his back looked like a woman's pelvic girdle and a, a womb waiting to receive a man's sperm. Her, uh, her friend said, uh, everyone's frightened of Elsa because she is frightened of nothing. And uh, it's, it's shadow, the shadow in the urinal also contained the profile of a white, of, of, of a Virgin Mary, a, 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 a veiled Madonna. In, once you've seen it, you can't, you can't ignore it. And America had unbelievably declared war on Good Friday. She signed the sculpture Ah Mutt, punning on Mutter, uh, because if it had been in the catalogue, it would have been put Mutt, Ah, Mutter, the German for mother. She was telling, with this extraordinary gesture, the American establishment, which she regarded as a gentleman's club, symbolized by a gents. She also argued why aren't the urinals for women. Uh, she, uh, uh, she was telling the American men, she was warning the men, men of America who ran America not to piss on her motherland as her philandering father had done to her, had done to her mother. She punned brilliantly in German and English. Our mutt, of course, also meant you are a mutt. The exhibition organizers, of which Duchamp was one, had promised to hang every work submitted. They would be shown to be mutts if they hung it, everyone would laugh at them, and mutts if they didn't because they'd have broken their own rule. Everything fitted in this extraordinary visceral visual attack, arguably the first great feminist work of art, and the first inst instance of concrete, in this case porcelain, poetry. Being a poet, Elsa couldn't care less what happened to the urinal after she'd made the gesture. This photograph was taken at the time by Alfred Stieglitz, and it's the only record of her visual poem. Duchamp made some reproductions later in the 60s and sold them. Uh, but understood within the context of her life, and a few other similar powerful tactile poems that survive. There's one amazing, there's a, there's a plumbing trap under this urinal, which she said looked like God. She put it on a mitre block, and it's just a G, and she said it spelled God, uh, plumbing trap, it's spelled G-O-D together, and she said if God is everywhere, he's there. <laughs> anyway, so that survives, the other, other, a few other things survive. Um, but w when, you, when, when you look at it, um, and you, and you appreciate it in the terms of her life, uh, you know, uh, this gesture has the imaginative and intellectual aura of all great works of art. When he stole this creation from Elsa 50 years later, Duchamp stripped it of the wholeness of its meaning. His explanations of Mutt, that he brought it from Mott's, a bathroom store in New York, meant nothing, and anyway, it was a blatant lie. Mott's was an upmarket showroom, not a shop. You couldn't buy anything from it. And it certainly never displayed a bog-standard urinal of this type, uh, which the impoverished Elsa used. It was made in Philadelphia, where she was at the time. By declaring that anything could be art, if an artist said it was, that art was just a thought in the mind and didn't have to be created or even seen, Duchamp not only hid his own deception and buried Elsa's genius, but also stripped art of any need to create a wholeness of meaning, any attempt to transcend time, and at the same time denied the audience the right to criticize artists for not doing so. The rape of art was complete, and so the myth of conceptual art was born, con art, I call it, and it was founded on a con. Of course, this non-art couldn't exist without a containing intellectual shell. Museums of modern art, which is a contradiction in terms if you think about it, have set about filling the gap left by Duchamp. Their spaces provide the aura of transcendence that is rightly the property of works of art themselves. So our galleries have become full of transient ephemera, while the real art of our times that seeks to create a lasting vision and which doesn't need museums to survive has been pushed off the public stage. Lasting art, however, survives, and I want just to end by showing you a few examples on a slightly more positive note. The real art survives, surprisingly, perhaps, if we had mention of photography, uh, the, which is the most ephemeral, you might say, of media. Uh, but uh, Cartier-Bresson uh, told me he regarded himself as an agitated Buddhist. Uh, he said he could sense when something was about to happen, a passing instant that would somehow, if captured, contain in its wholeness the significance of a time. That's what he was after. 
Uh, what William Blake talked about when he wrote, he who kisses the joy as it flies, enjoys, lives in eternity's sunrise. Uh, Stra Paul Strand, this famous photograph by Paul Strand, uh, uh, has this completeness that we look for in great works of art. Look at the light catching the lower sills like the Velasquez. We call it, it's a classic image because it has a lasting quality of art. Salgado's wonderful photograph uh, uh, is so still, so emotionally charged and beautifully composed that it's difficult to believe it's not a painting. But Salgado told me it wasn't arranged anything. He just saw it as a whole and he just seized the moment. The ever-diminishing trajectory of modernism, this ghastly con modern art, the superficial notion that art has to look modern to be modern, has taken art away from uh, the appearances of things, away from photography, away from any engagement with the appearances. Uh, Hopper, uh, who Alan talked about yesterday, uh, during his life was dis dismissed as a reactionary, but this painting, Sun in an Empty Room, painted in 1963, is a projection of a picture in the mind, not a slavish depiction of something seen. It is a profoundly haunting image of human loneliness within the fleetingness of existence. Modern art, in its panic to be different, has become increasingly superficial. It can't get much thinner. You can't get much thinner than a cutting edge. We need to look for wholeness, not newness, in art. One of the best painters I know, uh, uh, I know working today, is the German painter Peter Angermann. This painting called Hinton Fern, roughly translated as near and far, was painted in 2009, and it is a projection of a picture in the mind. As such, it is an image of anxiety, a very modern dilemma. How do you cope with other people's suffering, hate, and pain in your living room? This painting offers no solutions. It is not a program for action, but a meditation on a common experience. The reality of this painting is actually its surface. It's a painting of a television screen, unbelievably. You can see that by the channel logo in the top left. The painting is very large. The pictures are nearly life size. The screen reflects the family and the scene they are watching on TV. They are in the picture, but also watching the picture. This is an impossible conceit, but it works. Quite how, I'm not really sure, but it has something to do with the fact that we know a painted surface is unreal. It's a doorway into an imaginative space. In this imaginative space, we can experience the dilemma we have all faced, how to relate, relate two realities, one near and one far. The shortcut cartoon rendering of the figures adds a layer of comic irony to the situation, which prevents this tragic dilemma becoming in any way sentimental. And it also suggests the way we belittle things and make fun of them to cope with them. Angerman has, Angerman has painted an experience we all recognize and lifted it out of time. Angerman, for some reason, he couldn't tell me why, took photos of this painting as he worked in it. And I just want to run through them with you. Uh, uh, he'd never done it before, no, it hasn't since, as far as I know. But I want to rattle through these images. I would like you to notice, as I do, uh, how he is working on the whole picture all the time. It is the wholeness of the effect he is after, is he is after without which there is no art. This is the slow build-up to the total image, as it clarified in his mind. So now I want to play this sequence in reverse uh, and, and just let you see his creation disappear. Oh, I think I've... Have I, uh, no, there we are. This, this is going back now. I just want to... Show it disappearing. This is uh, just to show you that the whole thing is imaginative, imaginative space. And in the end, we are left with this, and this is the immaterial, transcendent space of art. Thank you. Can I go? <laughs> yes, yes, if you want. <clears throat> yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start, actually. Um, so I was just wondering, because we, we just came from the redemption example of art that uh, Ray Tallis um, referred to and Roger kind of echoed, and then we just saw this last painting, which actually I think is quite amazing. Um, but obviously the, the function seems to be a, a sort of a non-redemptive one. It's more of a, a sort of a commentary. It's a depiction of uh, a, a state of now that we, as you, as you said, we all know very well the idea that, you know, we sit in the living room and watch the news um, and see all this horror. And the question is, how do we kind of cope with it from this sort of detached perspective? But, it, but the picture itself is a kind of 
captures that moment rather than actually offering us something, uh, a way out of it, the redemptive kind of solution of, you know, uh, you know it, it, it offers us an ideal to which, which, we, which we could strive. Um, is, is that because you seem to be uh, endorsing that kind of work of art? And I'm just wondering uh, on that scale of kind of redemptive or, or realist depictions of art, um, uh, where, wh why, why are you actually, why, why are you sort of uh, championing that kind of thing? Well, uh, because I'm an atheist and I'm a, uh, uh, I have difficulty with the concept of redemption. So, and I have difficulty with, uh, with solving our problems. But I do, uh, I have a lot of sympathy with Ray's view of the wound in the present tense and the feeling we're not living fully. So anything that helps us uh, more, be more aware of our state, I think that painting helps us be more aware of our state. And I was amazed when I looked at it, I was amazed by it. And uh, it's very beautiful, much more beautiful than that because it's, the light in it is extraordinary. I haven't, I don't know any other artist who can paint the light, the pixels of a, of a television screen, but they, their painting just sparkles. And it's the sense of the presence of the painting and the sense of the presence of the whole, whole I mean, he's, he's, seen, he's created an image of our time which is true to our time. So that has to help. Whether it uh, is redemptive, I, I, I'm not sure I, I can't go into that. I can't answer your question. I'm the wrong person. I mean, I can sympathize with the, with the uh, as, a, as a, I'm not a Christian, but I can sympathize. I, I would like to be one, really, or a Muslim. I'd like to believe in God, but I've just, n in my life, got no evidence that uh, there is any helping hand anywhere. Uh, the, uh, anything doing as good in that sense. But I can still, that doesn't stop me appreciating, say, the Piero, which I find a wonderfully uh, moving, beautiful painting. I love it. But I, I'm not sure I'm redeemed by that either. I'm not really. Is that a, a total garble, isn't it? As you just said, the redemptive effect is in the fact that I see the person there having a, a struggle, which is my struggle too. How do I cope with this world on one hand, me cozy on the sofa, and on the other hand, the with world, you know, going crazy with a glass <laughs> of wine. Uh, so I, I feel, oh, somebody else has this trouble and cannot solve it. And this is the redemptive effect, I believe, in art. I'm not alone. Somebody else has the same struggle. And this is, I, I believe, the, the universal effect, once again, that art has. And I was just wanted to make a remark because there was this, uh, Ray, you mentioned this thing about um, the woman, you know, who had to stay in bed, who would still not, you know, before her uh, giving birth to a child, uh, still not go to read a beautiful novel or poetry. I think we should not, you know, separate too strongly from trivial art, from pop songs or pop culture in any way. I think they have pretty much the same effect and I, I don't feel so comfortable, you know, making this discernment between, you know, high art and low art, just, just as a comment. I agree with you. Um, yes, you mentioned, you referred at several points to the idea that uh, the work of art is in itself a mental something like a mental image yeah. or is inside the artist's mind which suggests that it's there first of all gets out onto the canvas and then is returns to the mind of the spectator but I, I wonder if that doesn't uh, undervalue the role of the canvas the pigment because the light in the Piero is surely something that, maybe I'm just showing the limitations of my own capacity for imaging, but I, I couldn't experience on the inside of my mind the light that I can see in the canvas. So I wondered if an alternative way of putting things would be to say that this wonderful object, this image, is something that is created on and through and in the canvas rather than being mental as opposed to physical, so that the image is, as it were, half in me and half out there in the world. Yeah, I, well, I, I've only talked about paintings in this talk, but I could talk about music, which is, which is uh, it's the same. 
the music is equally uh, what I'm trying to talk about is the the I don't want to belittle the process of 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 creating something like like uh, the Piero and and of course he's he's using a uh, material to convey this image but other people painted without creating that sense of light and stillness and silence extraordinary sense of silence and, but he had to know what he was doing to do that. And I'm not saying that an image is complete in the mind, and I actually haven't asked Peter Angerman whether this was totally complete in his mind, but it was pretty complete, I think, from the way he worked. He knew exactly where he was going. But, it, it, but a lot of artists, and, and any writer or composer or any creative person, has a conversation with themselves, with their medium, so that they discover what they want to say as they work. And they, and, and, but they know that as they're doing it, they write this sentence at the beginning of the novel and suddenly this sentence at the end doesn't work because, you know, they, they're always thinking, always, of the wholeness. And I only really want to talk about the wholeness of the shape, of, of, uh, which is the shape of our consciousness and the shape of our ability to communicate across with each other now. So it's this aspiration to art, to be whole, that I think our society has lost, and we're not critical of it. I mean, we don't, and, and we've lost it because we've been conned. And the museum, my profession, are partly, to, are largely to blame. And the, and uh, so, but it's all about wholeness. And that wholeness isn't necessarily just complete, but it doesn't have to be material. It can be a poem, it can be, it can be a dance, it could be anything, you know. It can be, it's something that is totally ephemeral, but it nevertheless, it's the shape I'm talking about, the wholeness. And the wholeness, and I know Ray says, if you start talking about saving the world, it's time to stop. But unless we start thinking about the wholeness of the world, we are going to be in a real mess. So wholeness is really important to us. And our abil extraordinary ability for us to communicate with each other is magic. It's magical, a magical property we have. And, you know, uh, in Korea or wherever, we're, wherever I'm to whoever I'm talking to, I can talk. And we can, uh, we can see we're sharing something. Wow, wow, how can we do this? It's amazing. But that's the only way we'll save the world, <laughs> by a wholeness. So I'm wishing on. Um, hi, I want to ask a question um, from the point of a young artist. Very personal question. Um, I trained from classical art atelier as a painter. And uh, I adore older masters like uh, you showing Da Vinci, Velasquez, and then uh, many of them, Rembrandt. Um, but I knew like uh, recently since I graduated, um, being a practice artist myself, I start questioning all about just the being as a level, as a great master, without representing rep representing who who we are, who I, uh, I am, my background, my uh, my age, um, my time. So I want to ask you, like, uh, because you're showing different age of artists, like uh, from the past to to present, and what do you think um, for the modern age, young artists? What do you think of each each one should showing? Um, our time, um, how, how you see in the wholeness in this. For example, as a Chinese artist, if I represent my art about Chinese culture, uh, well, other people has no uh, contact of that. Will they get inspiration from what I want to see in my image? Yeah. Thank you. Um. I've just been in China and just written a catalog for a show of a contemporary artist in China, uh, in Beijing. And uh, but it's abstract painting, and but it springs out of mad grass calligraphy of 11th, 12th century calligraphy, and it's fantastic painting. But the uh, but uh, I can't really answer your question because. Uh, um, art springs out, uh, you're the artist, you know, <laughs> you have to have your experience and, and people who are not artists need to be aware and be looking around all the time and saying what they, uh, whether they like it or not and whether it moves them and whether they feel it, what they feel. And at the moment, uh, there's this ghastly ph phony art that is covering everywhere. It's selling for vast sums, vast, vast sums, which, which, and I found this in China. They're all saying, they're all basically trying to do conceptual art or you know, because they see it costs money, it makes money. And, and, but it's not art. So 
Uh, all I can do is I say to you, you know, think of the wholeness of what you want to say and make sure it's personal and genuine and it's gen comes from genuine feeling. Then you might get somewhere and what else do I, what do I say? I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Well, thank you very much, <laughs>